Now, kidney also plays a role into removing the this foreign substance, the drugs, for instance, okay? Because remember, whatever drug we take, okay? For instance, if you're taking a liposolvable drugs, if I quickly mention some of the liposolvable drugs, okay? It could be, let's say, some of the drugs. If I quickly talk about some of the drugs, let's mention some of the drugs right here. It could be, let's say, paracetamol, okay? Uh, these are also called acetaminophen, all right? Or you have this... Uh, what is this? Tube is called, uh, your anti, your for the TB drugs, okay? For the TB, uh, for the TB drugs, it's the isonogenic drugs, okay? Or even ibuprofen, for for instance, okay? And then there's other drugs, like for example, prednisones. What are prednisones? That are steroids, right? They're steroids. So prednisones, even, okay? So this paracetamol, isonogen, ibuprofen, prednisone. Some of the xenobiotic drugs, okay, which are highly lipid soluble, okay. If they are lipid soluble drugs, then they what happens is that they would not able to get excreted out from the kidney, okay. Because remember, if they are lipid soluble, let's just make this, okay. If they are lipid soluble, then what's going to happen is that if they are lipid soluble, let's say, if they are lipid soluble, then it can easily diffuse from the from the cell membrane, okay. If they can easily diffuse from the cell membrane, then what's going to happen is that they would not able to get excreted out from the kidney. Okay, if they can easily diffuse from the kidney. So, so what really happens is that if they can easily diffuse, easily can cross the this uh, blood brain barriers or like any sort of like a basement membrane, like right here, okay, any membrane they can just cross it, okay. If they can cross it, then they would not able to get excreted out from the kidney, okay. So because of what happens is that any drugs which are highly lipid soluble, they have to go something called biotransformations, okay. And in pharmacology, you'll know more about what that means okay biotransformation basically means is that converting all this highly lipid soluble drugs into making and water soluble drugs okay so let me write it down so soluble so let's say it has to be water soluble water soluble for the kidney for the for, for from the kidney to get excreted out from the lipid soluble okay lipid soluble from from the lipid soluble, it has to be water soluble from the kidney to from the from the kidney to get excreted out, okay? And all these drugs, like I said, paracetamol or isonazid or ibuprofen or even pranisones, okay? These drugs have to be or even morphine too, okay? What happens is that these guys have to be water soluble, and then they, from their water soluble, they can get excreted out, okay? There is a reaction called conjugation reactions, okay? Where they have to put a glu glucuronic acid or something, okay? Oh, the polar charge has to come out, okay? And there's a phase one and phase two and all that kind of stuff too. But that's not important for us to know. We'll just stick with the basic right now. Basically, all the drugs that are highly lipid soluble, in order for them to get excreted out from the kidney, they have to be water soluble so that way, that way they can get excreted from the kidney, excreted out from the kidney. That is all I want to emphasize on this, okay? So they have to go to the biochemical reactions, biotransformation, we're sorry. It's called biotransfer reactions, okay? That's what I want to maintain for that, okay? We talk about how the metabolic excretion occurs, we'll talk about all that kind of stuff, right? Now, I'm going to quickly talk about these things, okay? So if you guys come back here, look. So you guys know, I talked about the structures, okay? So this is going to be my pyramids, okay? Pyramids and this area is going to be my cortex, okay? And cortex are usually, if you look at the histologic lipids, they're like dotted lines, okay? They're dotted. And this 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 cortex contains like a lot of nephrons, okay? They have like a, two types of nephrons. You have a juxta, medulla nephrons, which is around the medulla area, like around this, okay? And then you have a superficial nephrons, a cortical nephrons, all right? And then after that, you have these pyramids, okay? And these pyramids contain a lot of this, you have those, the, uh, the medullary rays, okay? These are the striated medullary rays, and this medullary rays contains, like, all this, uh, the loop of handling. Like, look, if I if I put one nephron right here, okay? What is this? This is going to be my glomerulus, okay? This is going to be almost quickly right this. So you have a glomerulus right here, okay? And these are peri these are capillaries right here, you see? And this is my basement memory I do. This is my basement memory. These are my endothelial capillary cells, and they have this, what is this? fenestrated because this is we're talking about kidney okay making a force and this is my bone end capsule right here and this is going to be my proximal convoluted tubules okay and then they have this brass water cells and then this is going to be my descending 
Okay, DCT, let's make this. And it's going to loop up Hanley, and then this is going to be my ascending limb, and this is going to be my distal convoluted tubules, and this is going to be my collecting tubules, or collecting duct, and this is going to be the urine. Okay? And urine, I, I do that in brown, but urine is, should be transparent yellow in order to be normal. I'll talk about that too. But anyways, now... And these are so these are cortex, right? So usually, usually it's the cortex, the superficial co uh, cortex, or superficial nephrons. Okay, they are the one that participate in whenever there's a more amount of water in your body. They are the one, or if, if you're drinking too much, then they are the one who will uh, participate in in informations of urine. Okay, and then from those wherever the urine comes, it it will drop into this renal papilla right here in the black color, and then from there it will go to minor calyx. Then it will become a major calyx. From the major calyx, it will be in the, it will drain into renal pelvis. And from the renal pelvis, it will drain into the ureter. From the ureter, it will drain into the bladder. Okay, that's how that's how it works. Now, but as I said, if I just remove one nephron and put it here, it looks something like this. Okay, there's one nephron I draw, but there are more than two million nephrons if you're if you're a normal person. Okay, so now, anyways, the point being here is that. The kidney in each part of this tubular, these are my tubular nephrons, okay? These are tubular melpi, a melpigian, you can call that also, okay? So in this tubular nephrons, okay, different part of these tubes, okay, play a very, very important uh, important role in uh, maintaining the uh, water and your ions, electrolytes, okay? Because whatever that gets filters out from here, right, it gets like reabsorbed by, it gets reabsorbed, okay? From the proximal tubule cells, from the distal conveyor tubule cells, uh, even from the DCT, Okay, even from the ascending, uh, from this ascending limb too. Okay, so different parts of them, they sort of like work into reabsorbing the water and electrolytes. Okay, to maintain the osmoregulations. Okay, so you need to maintain the osmoregulation because remember, when you're maintaining the osmoregulations, you're maintaining the waters and ions. Okay, that's what you're trying to do. So that's really, really important to maintain the blood volume or maintain the homeostatic. Okay, so kidney also play a role into that too. Okay, so we talked about that too. All right, now, and then we talk about regulatory acid B balance. Okay, we I slightly talked about that too, right? Because the kidney plays a very, very important role in maintaining those like a pH level. Remember by by producing bicarb or so. Okay, so whenever there is lots of acidic environment are there it's important to generate more bicarb okay so if you generate more bicarb what's going to happen is that that's going to work with the protein concentrations and then bring it level you know kind of like work with this so that's the reason why the your kidney also play a role into your acid base balance okay your kidney and your respiratory, they have to work in the same way, okay? They work simultaneously in a both way around, at the same time for them to, like, you know, work work, work efficiently, okay? So they, that's the reason why, you know, whenever we talk about, let's say, acidosis or alkal alkalosis problems, okay? There's both kidneys and your respiratory systems are involved into maintaining that like sort of like a inter environment inter environment constant okay that's what it does okay now kidney also regulates blood pressure okay so kidney regulates blood pressure two ways the one is a short way and one is a long way okay long way is obviously it has to do with the the, re, the reabsorption of this all these like electrolytes okay all these electrolytes and that takes a little time, okay? But then shorter way is that what it does is that it really is. If you guys come back here, okay? Okay, we talked about it. If you see here right here, this this is my, let's say this is my aorta, okay? And then here from the renal arteries coming out, right? And it's going to give all the segmental arteries and all that kind of stuff. We talked about it in all the class. But what is more important here is that this structure I do here on the right, this is afferent arteries, okay? And then afferent arteries have this, this specialized type of smooth muscle cells here, okay? These smooth muscle cells right here in a bluish color, we call them a granular cells, okay? Because they contain granules inside. And those granules contain very, very important enzymes, and we'll talk about that. I mean, we already said that. It's called renin, okay? These granular cells 
are also called juxtaglomerular cells. Juxta means near, near the glomerulus. Okay, that's what they are called. Juxtaglomerular cells. They're also called pericytes because they're kind of like peri. Okay, they're also called modified smooth muscle cells. Okay, and they're also called granular cells. Okay, and then you see like in the, in the brown right here, I drew this one. These cells are mesangial cells. Okay. Okay, and these mesangial cells are located outside because some of the mesangial cells are located also inside here. Okay, these are intramesangial cells, and they have some of the properties like phagocytotic process. They have those functions. Okay, they also produce immunoglobins, that kind of stuff. But these are located outside, so we call them extra mesangial cells. Okay, they're also given different name cells. You probably know like something called LASIK cells. Okay, they are also called Polky cells. Okay, or extra mesangial cells. Okay. And then the, you see the black, this one, it's coming out from the your distal conjugal tubules. These are very, very dense. That's what they call the, they call this a macula densa, okay? And these guys are very, very sensitive to the sodium chloride concentrations, okay? So all together, we three combine, we call them a juxtaglomerular apparatus, okay? Juxtaglomerular apparatus. And these are the one. Okay, they can sense it. Okay, with the whenever there's a low sodium concentration, low sodium chloride concentrations, whenever there is a sympathetic, because they have these beta one adrenergic receptors, beta one adrenergic receptor on this on this smooth muscle cells. Okay, on the granular cells or juxtaglomerular cells. Okay, and whenever they contract, they can reduce, they can produce renin. Okay, and renin is enzyme. Okay, it can convert. Okay. Angiotensinogen, which is produced by liver, to angiotensinogen number one, and then angiotensinogen number one gets converted to angiotensinogen number two in the lungs. At the what in the lungs? It's actually the capillary beds, endothelial cells of the capillary beds of your lungs. Okay, and then it becomes angiotensinogen number two, and angiotensinogen has a lot of functions. Okay, we're not going to go that, but we already we're not going to go there. Okay, but we're just mentioning that. That's how it maintains your blood pressures. Okay. Because that's the, one of the functions of kidney too, all right? And then, look, what is this? And we also said, we'll talk about it. It also produces prostaglandins, okay? Different part of this endothelial cells are located everywhere here. And they produce like the prostaglandins, and prostaglandins are like, like they're vasodilators, okay? They're vasodilators. They, they, they sort of maintain like auto-regulations of your kidneys too, okay? You can simply say that. Now, we have to talk about this guy right here. What is this? Erythropoietin, okay? So, kidney also produces this hormone called erythropoietin. And where from the kidney produces? So, guys, here, look, this is efferent arterioles. This is a glomerular capillaries right here, okay? And this is my what? Efferent arterioles, okay? Efferent arterioles. If you come back here, efferent arterioles, what is happening is the efferent arterioles break down into these guys. And these are called, I'm going to write it down here. It's called what? It's called peri tubular capillaries okay and this peritubular capillaries right here they have this endothelial cells okay these endothelial cells on the peritubular there's a special type of endothelial cells on the peritubular capillary beds okay and these en endothelial cells are very very sensitive to partial pressures of oxygen very sensitive to low partial pressures of oxygen okay they're very very sensitive to low partial so if they are okay so these cells have so-called like oxygen sensor okay receptor located on the cells and whenever they're receiving let's say let's say good amount of oxygen here okay they're receiving like good amount of oxygen here. then what happens is that that oxygens will inhibit the productions of erythropoietin okay let me repeat one more time whenever they're receiving oxygen here okay then these guys will inhibit the secretions of erythropoietin, okay? But whenever there's a partial pressure oxygen goes down or relatively low, then these guys can no longer can inhibit the erythropoietin secretions, okay? So if they can no longer inhibit the erythropoietin, erythropoietin secretions, then a lot of erythropoietin will sort of like erythropoietin okay there's a lot of it will get, get secreted or released and then it will go to the venules and it will go back to the infravena cava and ultimately it will go into the bone marrow house and in the bone marrow house these guys are going to stimulate okay very very important those precursors of the bone marrow cells okay specifically you want to remember this they're called prorythroblast okay because this pro whenever this prorythroblast they have tendency to tendency to go apoptosis okay so this erythropoietin 
whenever the, it's, it play a role as a stimulating factor, stimulating factors. So what it does is that when it stimulates that or giving it's providing the nutrients for that for the, the the precursors of the red blood cells to not to go to apoptosis so they start making the red blood cells so when you start making red blood cells what's going to happen is going to you're going to make you're going to have increase in hematocrit ultimately right so you're going to increase the red blood cells so that way you know increase the red blood cells red blood cells and the hematocrit can go up too right because you know Red blood cells are important for carrying oxygens, right? So that's reason why this play a very, very important role. Important role, or can you very, 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 very important role? That's reason why. That's reason why a lot of people who have a kidney transplant or sort of like diseases with the kidneys, it's really important to check their blood level. Okay, but now we have a drugs we can give, which is called erythropoietin. You can give into them. That's why it's really important. You know, people who have a kidney disease, they can have pneumonia, or they can have anemia. Okay, anemia if there is a production of erythropoietin is decreased. Okay, so that's the reason why it's really important to check for their blood level. Okay, now that is what. Kidney does. Kidney also produces this calcitriol, which is the active vitamin D. Okay, if I remember, not going to go super detail. What happens is that you know there is a inactive vitamin D. Okay, that is coming from the liver, which is a it's called 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. Okay, and then what happens is that that gets that gets and then that gets and then sort of like it gets in the proximal tubule cells. And this proximal tubule cells has an enzyme which is called one alpha. One comma alpha hydroxy, okay. So the hydroxylase enzymes, okay. And what it does is that one alpha hydroxylase enzymes, okay. And what it does, it puts one, it puts, it puts this one hydroxyl at the, what it puts puts this hydroxyl group, hydroxyl group in the position number one, the carbon number position number one, okay. And that makes it twenty one comma twenty five hydrox dihydroxy calciferol okay and that is my active vitamin okay and this active vitamin d is called calcitriol and remember calcitriols are very very important for what for when it goes to gi what it does it tries to reabsorb those calciums okay and in the bones it try, it it plays a role into depositing calciums into those bonds okay so that way the, the bone density and bone mass can be stronger and go so that's why the vitamin d is a very very important if there's a there's a there is a problem with the calcitriol deficiency. You can get something. There's a condition called osteomalacia or something. Okay, you can get that. All right. That one. That's what it does. What it does. Kidneys also do a gluconeogenesis, which means basically means is that as I said, it can make a glucose from the non-carbohydrate sources. So that's what the kidney does. Okay. Now, kidney. What else can you do? Whenever I talk about regulation of acid-base balance, you know, kidneys also. You know, from the protein, the digestive materials are what? The digest the they also the remove the sulfuric acid, let's say all of this phosphoric acid, right? All this sulfuric and phosphoric acid kidneys also excrete out that, okay? That's what is happening. And a lot of those excretions are drugs, the urea creatine that is happening from this peritubular capillaries, okay? That is what is happening here. And simultaneous reabsorption also happens like this. Okay, and we'll talk about this. Whenever we talk about the glucose infiltration rate and we talk about each com compartment, we'll talk about more about that. But right now I'm just fo fo uh, focusing on the functions of this. Okay? Now, after this, one thing that I do have to, I'm going to quickly talk about is that, if you see right here, I mean, I, I drew this in color is urine, right? Okay? So, kidney maintains the water, Okay, and then ions, okay, and depends on the kind of what kind of diet you have ate, that's how the urine is going to come out, right? Usually, a normal urine color is very, very important, okay? It's usually a transparent, yellowish color, that's the normal urine, right? If you drink, let's say, too much water, okay, you're overhydrated, okay, or maybe even in some diabetic, some diabetic conditions, you can see a clear, uh, clear urine, okay? So, you should be very very cautious okay about this and then sometimes let's say if you see if you see sort of like a port wine let's say here i draw in a pink right here if you see this uh let's say port wine pink urine okay if you see that in in the in your urine 
what if that tells you about? Do you guys remember the port one, like pink urine? You can get it from some kind of conditions. Remember, porphyrias, porphyrias from the hemo, porphyrias, let me write down here. Those porphyrias, I don't know how to spell this, but anyway, you know what I'm talking about, right? The porphyrias are those in the hemoglobin synthesis, if you guys remember that, you know, from your porphobilinogen, porpho you make hydroxymethabilin, okay? And from the porpho because lady, because initially we're trying to make heme, right? From the porphobilinogen, there's an enzyme called porphobilinogen deaminis. Okay, or they're also called as hydroxymethyl bilin synthesis. Okay, so porphobilinogen, porphobilinogen deaminase, or hydroxymethyl bilin synthesis. If you have an enzyme, if that enzyme deficiency, then you can get this condition called acute intermediate porphyria. Okay, and when you have that conditions, what do you get? You can get port wet, port like port wine, sort of like the pink is called urine, okay? Because of the because you're not gonna eventually make what heme, right? So that's that kind of urine you, you can get. And the reason why you get those urine is because those porphobilinogen, what happens is that it's the amount of oxygens, okay? And, the amount of oxygen it receives, it polymerizes, okay? And more it, more it get polymerizes, the color will change, okay? You get to see that. And then, so you can get, you can see, you can see that, okay? So if you see a clear, or if you see a very, very yellowish, or uh, that could be because of the, the kind of very yellowish, that could be because of like certain diet that you have taken in, okay? So that diet also contributes on the work in a urine that you are, you're having, okay? So it's really important to also examine you know, looking at the what kind of color urine you're passing out, all right? That's what I wanted to emphasize on. So, so this is all I have for you guys. Um, I hope uh, I made it very clear to you guys. Uh, thank you very, for, thank you for watching, and please quickly hit that subscribe for me. Thank you.